term mannerism is both a stylistic and period label. Historically, it designates the period in Italian art between the High Renaissance and the Baroque era, roughly 1520 to 1600. As we'll see, however, though the term originated in Italy, the stylistic designation would expand to include the art of other countries. The term maniera, Italian for style or stylishness, was first popularized through the writings of Vasari. According to Vasari, early mannerisms, elegant, refined, somewhat artificial but courtly style, is a variation rather than a break with the high Renaissance. The first signs of this variation appeared in Florence in the workshop of Andrea Dagnola, called Del Sarto. Since Andrea was the son of a tailor, he was given the nickname Del Sarto, which means of the tailor. His Saint Sebastian illustrates the monumentality and sculptural form inspired by Michelangelo. However, the nearly monochromatic quality of the flesh and background provide a vivid contrast to the aquamarine color of the garment. This vibrancy of color, created through contrast, marks an important precedent for the coloration techniques used by later Mannerist painters. As the Mannerist style developed, imagination and invention took precedence over exact realism. Painters began to replace the clarity, harmony, and naturalism of their predecessors with more complex compositions, exaggerated proportions, sophisticated design, and discordant colors. All of these characteristics are readily apparent in this work by Francesco Cavazzoni, titled Legend of the Finding of the True Cross. Notice the awkward body positions and hand gestures. Notice, too, the small heads, elongated figures, and exaggerated musculature. These conventions are characteristically mannerist, as is the chaotic composition. In fact, the figures almost seem to be tipping off of the canvas. The subject of Cavazzoni's painting is derived from a fictional story about Queen Helena, the mother of Constantine, who traveled to the Holy Land in search of Christ's cross. There she discovers three crosses, and desiring to discern which of the three is the Savior's, she orders that each cross be passed over a sick person. The first cross supposedly throws the invalid into convulsions. The second has no effect upon the sufferer. But as the shadow of the third passes over the sick boy, his infirmities are healed and this final cross designated as the true cross. From a representational standpoint, the painting is a poor work. However, as a mannerist, Cavazzoni was not aiming for naturalism. Notice, for example, that he sets the work in a foreign-looking place with fantastic architecture and a dramatic skyline. This is his imaginative rendering of the Holy Land. He also spreads his actors over the space, allowing the viewer to see each one without any obstruction. The story is also fantastic, a perfect counter-reformation drama. All the characters are emotionally affected by what they see, and each reacts personally. Cavazzoni's lack of definite focal point actually reinforces this aspect of the scene. No one character dominates, though those in the foreground are more central to the action. It is fascinating to watch the story unfold visually. Giovanni Antonio Bazzi takes the Mannerist vision even further. As one of the dominant Sienese painters, Bazzi's influence reached as far as Rome during his lifetime. In this work, his distant landscape, garish colors, and sinuous treatment of the figures are characteristic of his uniquely mannerist style. Notice that the bodies of the tormentors writhe in their effort to scourge Christ. In addition, their awkward poses exacerbate the tension of the scene. For example, look at the soldier on the right holding the flag. He is painted from at least three different vantage points, accounting for the impossibility of his contorted stance. Though born in Crete, El Greco would become the first great artist of the Spanish school. He is one of the most celebrated and castigated artists in history. 
medieval, mystical, devout, decadent, mannerist, mad, and modern are but a few of the adjectives historians have used in describing the provocative painter. Little is known of his early life in Greece. We do know that he began as an icon painter, and remnants of this early tradition would continue to influence his style, particularly his religious works. But by 1567, he, like many other painters, had left his homeland for Italy. He settled first in Venice, where he immersed himself in studying the works of Titian and Tintoretto. Like Titian, he was captivated by the expressive potential of oil painting. Like Titian, he was also a highly successful and innovative portrait painter. In 1570, El Greco went on to study in Rome. His time there, however, was unproductive. His admiration for the Venetian style made him contemptuous of Roman and Florentine painting. He went so far as to say of Michelangelo that he was a good man who could not paint. Such opinions won him few commissions. And in 1576, he set out for Spain, where he would spend the remainder of his career and where his unique genius would come into full flowering. This penitent Peter is a marvelous example. Notice first that El Greco uses traditional iconography in portraying Peter, including the symbolic keys and the yellow gold garment of faith. The figure is also masterfully framed and isolated from the background scene, which is a montage of the crucifixion and resurrection. In the upper left register, we see what looks like thundering clouds and sheets of rain pouring down on Golgotha. Then, moving down toward the center of the canvas, we take in the blinding light and the angel atop the tomb. Then in the middle ground, we see the approaching Savior holding a globe, a light in the center with a candle, symbolizing the light that has now redeemed the world. Though El Greco achieved fame during his lifetime, his later work was so intensely personal that his influence on artists of the next generation was minimal. In fact, his reputation soon declined, but would soar again in the 19th century with the Impressionists and continue with the emergence of 20th century Expressionism. Towards the end of the century, the Dutch town of Harlem also developed a distinct Mannerist movement. Jonah under the gourd vine at Nineveh by Martin van Heemskerk is a good illustration. Heemskerk was among the second generation of Netherlandish artists to sojourn to Italy. Settling in Rome for five years, Heemskerk concentrated on drawing from nature, from classical architecture, and from the contemporary art of Michelangelo and Raphael. The monumentality and pose of the figure of Jonah indicated the profound impact of Michelangelo on the artist, while the coloration and fantastical landscape reflect the influence of the Mannerist style. This panoramic architectural landscape also illustrates some of the actual sites Heemskerk would have seen in Rome, including the Vatican Obelisk and the Tiber Bridge. We'll be examining this eternal city's continuing impact on Baroque art in our next session 